Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs, and if you can, open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Chapter 3, we're entering the third chapter of a six-chapter book, so we're making progress through this magnificent letter from the Apostle Paul. We're going to read this morning verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. Paul goes a bit biographical. He has a point in doing that, a bit biographical. Both this passage and the following section hang together as, as one overarching section of Ephesians. We're going to take it in two messages, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 this morning. So let's begin reading in Ephesians. Verse 1, chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul is about to launch into a prayer in this passage. This is one of those passages where you, you feel the, the human reality of this letter. Uh, you notice there in verse 1, it says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of, for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and then there's a dash, and it's as though Paul has an interrupting thought that causes him to, to digress from verse 2 to all the way down to verse 13. Because if you look down there in verse 14, he picks up the exact same language that he used at the beginning of chapter 3. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. It's the same word. And so it seems like what, what's happening here is Paul starts to head into a prayer for spiritual strength, and then he, he feels the need for an additional uh, commentary, an additional digression of thought regarding the uh, unveiling of the plan for the church and his role in that plan. He thinks that would benefit, that would edify, that would continue this whole discussion he's been having with them about the value that they have as Gentiles and being part of God's church. And so verses 2 through 13 are, are just Paul coming at the same theme again, the value of being including, included in God's people, but from yet another perspective. So just to give us a little bit of a reminder where we are in the book again, chapter 1 is all about the abundant spiritual blessings that every believer has received in the gospel, the surprise blessings. The beginning of chapter 2 chronicles the spiritual journey that a believer makes from death to life through the grace of God. And the second half of chapter 3 starts talking about salvation from the standpoint of ecclesiology, which is a word for the doctrine of the church, and how Gentiles have been made a part. They're no longer exiles. They've been made a part of the church. So it's, it's this idea of a, a theological overview. Here's, here's what's happened. You were outside, and now you're inside. You were exiles, and now you're members, he's saying. That, that's the first, or the second half, rather, of chapter 2. Then in chapter 3, what this digression does, it's on the same theme. It basically says, how was that plan proclaimed or implemented in history? So part of my goal in preaching through Ephesians is that we would have a sense of the book, right? So we have spiritual blessings, chapter 1, spiritual journey, chapter 2, membership in, of the church in a theological overview, for second half of chapter 2. Then chapter 3, it's, it's membership in the church from the standpoint of history. How was it unveiled in history that Gentiles could be a part of God's people, that it was no longer a, a single race that God would call his own? And so that's what he's doing in this passage. He's unveiling their own story 
the story of their inclusion. And I think that's, that's his heart really in this passage. And you, you can feel that as you read. There's, there's such an emphasis on grace and privilege in this passage and the incredible news that a, a mystery has been unveiled. I think the goal is that they would treasure the plan of God to include them in his church as it was unveiled in history. That, that's what he wants to happen. He wants them to treasure God's plan to include even them in his church, among his people. And I think that's what he wants to happen in us this morning, that we would treasure God's plan to include us, that as we hear this story, we would see our own history in this event. I like reading biographies. I know maybe some of you do as well, but I, I love biographies. I love historical biographies of figures and leaders and different parts of the world, different eras in history and, and seeing how the world looked through their eyes. And many biographies uh, begin not with the person's birth, that will be the topic, but with what preceded that. So they, they'll talk about the, the heritage and the parents and even sometimes the grandparents of this individual and how they came to be where they were at the time of this person's birth. And they'll, they'll talk about their family story and whether there was suffering or abundance. You might go back to where they traveled from a distant land, for example. And I, I think of this passage as basically Paul recommending a question to us. How would you tell your story? If you were going to write your autobiography, how would it begin? Or what would it include? Would it only reference, say, the moment that you came to faith? The moment that you were transitioned from death to life? He would say, well, that's excellent. That's chapter 2, the first 10 verses. But it should also reference your transition from exile to membership. That, that's part of your story too. That's the first or the second half of chapter 2. But it should also reference your story. Your story should also reference how the, the word, this mysterious, mysterious privilege was unveiled in history. That should be a part of your story. And, and this actually should be a part of our story. So let me ask us maybe a hard question this morning. If somebody asked you, what's the most important parts of your story, who you are? Would chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 be included? That's a question for us to ponder. The question is, is the unveiling of God's plan to bring us into his people, is that an essential part of my story as I would conceive it if I was going to write it? Would I write down, well, the first thing you have to understand is uh, there was this news that nobody would have thought of. It was impossible news, but it led to where I now am as, as a member of God's people. But I, I have to tell you the story. I have to tell you what happened because nobody thought of this. Nobody could think of this story. This news was, was too good to possibly be imagined by a human being. And so what happened was God, God called an individual named Paul and he revealed this to him, this incredible news. And then Paul began to proclaim this to the world and to tell everyone, guess what? You too can be included in the people of God because of Christ Jesus and because of the grace of God. And not only included in a secondary status, you can be included as fellow members, fellow partakers of the promise. No lesser status. It's this amazing journey of a message without which we could not be members of God's people. You could imagine it, it would be it would be as if somebody was telling the story of their own um, nomination to a particular office or their own elevation to the kingship or something of some country, and they would say, "Well, you, you have to understand. Uh, part of the backstory here is that there was this ambassador, and, and he came, and and I had no idea. I had no idea that I, I had this privilege and this right that God had given to me. I never would have known. I would have lived forever in exile. And then here he came with this incredible." news and and nobody would have thought of this it was a big secret but then he started telling everybody this and I realized oh my gosh I, I get to be included that's my place that's my role your children would would want to hear it again T tell me again the, the story about how the, the the news was told 
Your grandchildren want to hear the story because you tell it with such passion. Oh, you, have to, you have to hear the story of how the news was told. It's not just that I'm in now. It's not just that I'm saved now. It's not just that I'm a, a member now. Let me tell you every detail of the story so you can, you can see the value. I want, to hear, I want to hear more. Tell me more about how exactly you came into this privileged position. Well, well there was a part of it where the, the message was unveiled. Let me tell you that part. All of this aiming to help us treasure God's plan that we're included in the church. And, and if I can say frankly, we desperately need more study in this area because in our Western culture, we presume access, don't we? We assume access. I assume I should be allowed in there. What do you mean I can't be in there? How come I can't be included in there? That's just the assumption of our culture. What do I have to do? I gotta pay some money, I gotta you know, do a membership due, salute somebody, I mean, I, I should be, I can be in there. Very minimal, I should be allowed in there. What do you mean I can't? Do not cross is not a line that I obey. <laughs> Does not apply to me, of course I can be in there. That's the, that's the assumption. It's almost as though the idea that we have uh, <laughs> rights applies to everything. I have the right to be anywhere I want to be. But the Bible comes from a very different mindset. The Bible says, no, you don't. No, you don't. You can't bust your way in. You can't ask your way in. You can't get in there. You're not allowed in there. So he, it, Paul is coming to a place where, where he's kind of communicating to the Christians, look, 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 you would have no way to be a part of God's people on your own. Now you have to have that assumption settled in your mind or else the value of being included in God's people will diminish. We have to have settled in our mind that we have no inherent right to be called among God's people or the value of all of these passages communicating the privilege and the story. And we, we would lose interest, wouldn't we? Imagine if you read one of those biographies and it's about George Washington or something and you had no idea who he was or why it mattered that he lived. And you're reading about, you know, some person that came from England on a ship and established a plantation in Virginia and you're listening to that and thinking, who cares? Why does this matter? I don't, this doesn't matter at all. If we don't value the inclusion as something that we, we didn't deserve, we couldn't earn, we won't treasure the story of how we got there. Treasure. Treasure the story. Treasure God's plan to include you in his church. All right, three points I want to make that is Paul's goal of drawing out this story. And I want to appeal to us to, to listen in to Paul. He's speaking as though he would to children who want to hear the, the adventure story of how the, the, the present case came to be so. That, that's Paul's heart. Guess what? I, I, I didn't tell you this part yet. Let me tell you this part. First, the messenger, the messenger, the revelation, and the content. Those are the three points, the messenger. Paul begins, as I said, about to pray. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And it's no wonder that he digresses because you can imagine what comes to his mind. May, maybe they're not totally clear why I'm in prison on their behalf. Maybe, maybe that's not clear. Maybe they just think I'm weird or I like prison. Or I mean, maybe I need to clarify why, why would you be doing this? Why are you in prison on our behalf, Paul? You're in prison for Christ Jesus. So you belong to Jesus. So why does Jesus have you in prison? They could ask. Why would Jesus have Paul in prison? Paul says, on behalf of you Gentiles. You can, you can hear the, the sense, what? I, I didn't ask you to go to prison for me. So no wonder he digresses. And then he, he wants to make, make a, a, a statement. He says, look, I, I know you know this, but let me restate it again. Assuming you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. The messenger. This is Paul the Apostle. We know about him from the book of Acts and elsewhere. He was saved dramatically from a hatred and a defiance of the church and brought into a place of being uniquely called of God to proclaim the gospel to the non-Jewish world. That was Paul's unique calling. He was the apostle to the Gentile world. That's everybody that isn't a Jew, okay? To the Gentile world, that's what Paul does. 
It's dramatically saved, and he ministers for many, many decades, and we think this book, Ephesians, was written around the sixth decade uh, of the first century, so 60, 61, 62, 63 AD. He's in prison in Rome because of his testimony of the gospel to the Gentiles. The Jewish nation did not want to see the Christian message promoted. They did not like Paul, and so they put him before the Roman governor, and he was taken to jail, and it is in Rome, and he's trying to encourage the churches from there. And so what he's explaining is, how did I get myself in this situation on your behalf? Here's how I did. I, I did because God gave me a task, and it was for you. I had something to steward. It was grace. And what I think he means by that is the grace of this message to be proclaimed. You're going to hear more about that next week. This message to be proclaimed, this stewardship, this task has been given to me in a unique way, and it's for your benefit so that you can be included in the people of God. I'm the messenger, he says. I'm the unique messenger. I'm the apostle. I'm called to steward this incredible news, this treasure, you might say, this treasure of a news, and I want to bring it to you. And the fact that this messenger is willing to go to prison for the sake of his message and the fact that everything about him is for the benefit of these Gentile believers I think heightens the value of our inclusion in the church. If, if, a, if a messenger has a worthless message, he doesn't go to prison for it. And if a messer, messenger has a, a sort of a generic message, you wouldn't say it's for you. This stewardship, what does it say there? It's for you. I'm in prison for you on your behalf. God's grace was given to me for who? For you. What's Paul saying? God has something for you, believer. And every person in here fits into the category of this Ephesian church. It's as though God could say this directly to you. God had Paul go to prison and steward this message of surprising grace, this message of inclusion for you. This is your story. If you are a believer, this is your biography right here. God chose him to declare to the world, God wants to include you in his people. Ephesian believer. Texas believer. This should begin to produce gratefulness, awe, appreciation, perhaps even that, that sense of discomfort you get when someone gives you an exorbitantly generous gift. Have you ever, you ever had that experience? I had recently experienced somebody just surprised me with this, what I thought was a incredibly, what it was, generous, generous gift. And I, I wanted to call them, but honestly, there was something in my soul like, I don't want to call them because I don't even know how to say thank you for this. Have you ever had that experience? There's this sense of, I don't even know. <laughs> how do, what do I say? I mean, what words can I possibly say to communicate the value of this? I think that's supposed to be something of the effect this has on us. This is my spiritual history. This is how I'm included. I'm not included because I thought to walk into a church or I'm more religious than my neighbor or I'm a particularly nice guy and I like hanging out with other Christians. No, no, no. No, this is the real history. This is the real story of how I came to be included in God's people. How I came to be in this room right now is much more about this than any natural disposition I have. The story of the messenger promotes the value of our inclusion. The messenger. Secondly, the revelation. The revelation. Paul continues to develop how this story came about. He says, Here, here's what happened. Uh, before me, before I was a messenger, um, I, I was blind. I didn't know anything about this. This doesn't originate, originate with me, he says. There was revelation. Revelation is the second emphasis here in the passage. He says, here's, here's what, what I, I'm assuming you know. The mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. I think he's talking about the paragraph above. The mystery was made known to me by revelation. Revelation is this idea that God has revealed something that couldn't be known otherwise. And when you read this, 
you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, you want to notice the accent in all of this is revelation, something that could not be known, that was not known, which has now been revealed. Because these words are so important, I, I want to do a little bit of technical work here, if you'll indulge me. And I want to look at these two words revelation and mystery because they're really important in the new testament and we'll probably come to them again in some other books let me just seize a moment and reference harold honer a commentator on ephesians he says this the word revelation revelation the greek word is apocalypsis has the meaning of unveiling or disclosing something that had been previously hidden in the new testament it has the theological significance of the unveiling of that which was previously hidden in God and unknown to humans. It is not the acquisition of knowledge by diligent searching, but the unveiling of acts intrinsically hidden. It is not the acquisition of knowledge by diligent searching, but rather the unveiling of acts intrinsically hidden. And then there's the second word, mystery. Very important to understand what mystery means when it's used in the New Testament. That which is made known to Paul by revelation is ta mysterion, is in the Greek, the mystery. The mystery was hidden in God and cannot be unraveled or understood by human ingenuity or study. It is not something that is mysterious inherently mysterious but rather a revealed secret to be understood by all believing people and not just a few elite one english translation you could use would be the word surprise it's not that it's inherently mysterious it's just unknown until it's revealed one of my favorite commercials on television, it's, it's quite old now, but one of my favorite ones is the one about the guy, maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. He's on the phone, he's checking on his credit score, and he says, I don't like surprises. And he walks up to his door, and he's unlocking while he's on the phone, and he opens it up, and it's his birthday party. And they scream surprise, and he screams exceedingly unmanly, unadult-like scream. <laughs> And, and he screams, and the guy on the phone hears him, are you okay? And he says, not really. And, 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 and it's, it's a surprise, right? It, it was unknown to him, and now it is known. He doesn't like that surprise. Well, there are good surprises, right? But the point is, a surprise is something you don't know. It's not inherently mysterious or murky in that sense. It's just that you don't know it. You can't find it out. That's mystery in the New Testament. So Paul will use the word mystery a lot. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, some confusing truth of the gospel that only certain Christians could know. Let me make that very clear. The word mystery in the New Testament, it does not mean some confusing truth of the gospel that only certain Christians could know. No, no. Paul uses the word mystery to help understand you could not have known this except now God has revealed it to you. And you want to notice that the revelation is now made plain. Every common believer in Ephesus, it says, can perceive the insight Paul has into the mystery of Christ. I don't think that is primarily Paul boasting. Like, you can see how smart I am when you read this. I don't think that's the right translation paraphrase. I think the point is, you, you can perceive the insight I have or have been given into Christ. You can perceive this. I think that's the right accent here. This isn't Paul saying, if you would just read my dissertation, you would appreciate how magnificent my intelligence is. That's not what he's saying. He's, he's saying, you too. You too. You can perceive. Just, just by reading. It's just by reading. You don't need symbols. You don't need candles. You don't need to smell your way to this. No, no, no. No, it's right here. Just read, read the paragraph. Very clear. Fellow heirs, no longer exiles. Right there out in front, right? Not a, a confusing thing that every Christian can't know. Every Christian can know this. You are included in the people of God. Just read it. Just read it. It's right here. It's right here. Not confusing. Unknown. Could not have been known, but now revealed and now perceivable. That's what Paul's saying. And to heighten the benefit of this, he says, this incredible news was not known in previous generations. 
was not known in previous generations. So this is not only a surprise, this is a new surprise. This is a, a surprise that was intentionally withheld until this era. And so you have this privileged era. Other passages in the scripture speak the same way, that we behold things in salvation, the things into which angels long to look, or that the prophets peered to see but could not see fully. That's what's going on here. Paul's saying, look, th- there's, there's a news here that was not known to Abraham or Moses or Jacob or Joseph or, or Elijah or Adam. It was, it was not known to them. It was not known to them. But guess what? You, you have been chosen to know something that even they did not know. And here's what it is. It's that the Gentiles, those outside of God's promise, outside of God's people, those with no right to know God or be included with God's people, here's the news. They're one in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament, of course, knew that the Gentiles would be blessed by Abraham's offspring. They knew that the nations would be impacted, that God's glory would go to the ends of the earth. But this idea of a a unified people, one in Christ, identities ethnically basically submitted or submerged under their identity in Christ, that idea, that was new. That was new. That's what he's saying. They didn't know about that. This is news that you've been entrusted with, that you've been given. The revelation was made plain. It was only revealed in the new age, the post-Christ era. And let me make a strong distinction again between what you might call the Western culture of presumptive membership. The Western culture of presumptive membership says, I should be included because I deserve to be. The Bible says, you can think that if you want, but it's not convincing to God. You can think that you should be included, but it makes no difference to God that you're included. Only God can decide who's actually included. You might imagine a person who says, I I am going to that uh, exclusive party. Well, are you sure you're included? I am going. I am sure I'm included. I'm confident I'm included. I'm confident I'm on the guest list. I am absolutely sure I am on the guest list. And then they go and they, 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 they realize as they're driving, they realize, you're, you're going to the White House. Yes, I am. I'm sure I'm included on the guest list. No problem. I am sure I can get in. You know why? Because I am an American and I get to go in there. Well, then you show up and guess what? The dude with the gun and the black tie at the door says, I don't care what you think. You're not going in there. And that's just one small nation on the earth. The reality is, objectively, the only person who can say that a, <laughs> that a human being, sinful, who had rebelled against God, can be included in the people of God and the covenants of promise is not that person, it's God himself. And so the benefit of this passage is to say, God has said that you, Gentile Ephesian, are included in his people if you've believed in Jesus. Who cares what an individual thinks they should be allowed to be in? What matters is if God says, yes, you are. We have to distinguish between presumption and assurance. Many Christians operate on presumption, and then their faith is tested, and it cracks because presumption is not trustworthy. It's like a facade of iron that's actually brittle. God is trustworthy. Christians that go into trial, trials of their faith, temptations, they need assurance, not presumption. Presumption does nothing in a test of faith. The assumption that I should be included, the assumption that everybody should be included if they want to be. No, 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 no. The only assurance we have in a trial of faith is God. God has said that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are included in my people. That's the assurance that holds us steady in a test of faith. That's the assurance that Paul's trying to press into them. How do I know I'm included? Well, because of course I am. No, because God has said you can be in Christ. The revelation impresses on us the honor, the assurance, the grace of being included in the people of God. Finally, the content. The content, Paul, having explained the journey, the story, the backstory of how this revelation was unveiled in history through his ministry, 
And he's going to talk more about that next week, specifically through the preaching of his ministry. He, he now wants to state again, I, Paul cannot get enough of the glory of this because I think Paul has a biblical mindset. In Paul's mind, it is surprising enough that God chose one nation out of the sinful humanity to be called as his own. The fact that God chose some out of every nation blows Paul's mind. He would say, look, it's surprise enough that there was one nation. That's surprise enough. God didn't have to choose anybody to be his people. But he did. Here's an even bigger surprise. He chose some from every nation. And so he reiterates the truth that in his mind is glorious and assuring and majestic and something to be treasured and valued. He says, here's, here's the mystery. Let me state it again. Let me state it. I, I just have to say it again. It's like he says that. I, I just can't. Can I say this again? This is so amazing. Let me say it again. I, I just talked about it, you know, for like 10 verses. But let me say it again. This mystery is, here it is, that the Gentiles, the Gentiles, you know the Gentiles are? The sinful heathen pagans who don't believe in the one true God. That's the historic view of the Gentiles to the Bible. They're the people that worshiped Baal and bowed to Ashtoreth and gave their children to Molech. That's the Gentiles to a Jewish mindset. And Paul, the Jew, the faithful Jew, says the Gentiles, the Gentiles are members, they're fellow heirs, not lesser heirs, fellow heirs, together heirs, you might say together heirs not heirs over here with the other nation over here they're together heirs it's a single word in the greek together heirs together members all these words have that same prefix of togetherness three three times in a row together heirs together members together partakers together 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 paul says <laughs> together it doesn't quite come across in english but it's very clear in the greek together heirs together members of the same body together partakers of the promise Together, 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 you're together. You're together with God's people. He's just jumping up and down. He can't stand it. He wants them to feel the assurance of this. Not second-class citizens. Not exiled. Not without God, without hope. Your inheritance is God himself in all of his blessings in Christ Jesus. Your inclusion is in the same body. You are not exiled. You are not second class. You are a part of this, and we are a part of you, and we are a part of this together, and you're partakers of the promise. That could be all the spiritual blessings, or possibly, as some commentators say, the promise of the Holy Spirit, God himself, indwelling believers. Earlier, the promise is referenced as the Holy Spirit. It's possible that's what Paul's talking about here. There's a promise of the Holy Spirit that has been, has been brought not just to Abraham's ethnic children, but to every person who believes in Jesus. That's the content. You're included is the content of this mystery. You're included. Christ, the Savior of people from every tribe and nation. That's the content. And how did this content come about? In Christ Jesus through the gospel. In Christ Jesus through the gospel. I mentioned before in Ephesians, it's, it's important to understand. In Christ Jesus uh, is, is a theological term. It's not a physical idea. It's a theological idea. In Christ Jesus means you have been brought in to the sphere that is Christ Jesus. The best biblical metaphor I, I know of this is the ark. All right, the ark where the people were safe from judgment and received the blessing of life and protection. In that sense, theologically, we have been brought in to Christ Jesus. So when I teach my children, just uh, when I teach them about the ark, I usually call it a special place to save them. What did God have them build? A special place to save them. That's where they were when the flood came. In this case, we didn't build it. We were put in it by sovereign grace, a special place to save them. They are in Christ Jesus theologically, covered by his righteousness, over, <laughs> overseen by his mercy, forgiven by his death in Christ Jesus. And how did that come about? Well, they heard a message through the gospel. 
The gospel was proclaimed. Sinners heard that they were under God's wrath. They heard that they needed a substitute to die in their place. They saw through the preaching of Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ crucified on that cross, dying as an innocent victim and believing in him, they were brought into Christ Jesus. And in that place, they are fellow heirs, fellow partakers, fellow members. That's what's happening inside that sphere. They heard the news that no longer would they need to be exiled because of their deadness and their sin. Rather, God would make them alive and bring them into the the blessings of his grace, into an inheritance and being God's own inheritance. That their sins would no longer count against them towards God. That they would now be ushered in freely into God's presence. That they would no longer be strangers and aliens. They would be sons and daughters. This is what Paul communicated to them. You, if you believe in Jesus, God has made you right with God in Christ Jesus through the gospel those who were far off have been brought near those who were alienated have been made citizens those who were isolated have been brought together don't lose the church accent of this. This is not merely talking about individualized salvation. It's talking about individuals who are saved and simultaneously brought together to Christ and to others who are also in Christ. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, what does it mean to treasure, as I think Paul wants us to do, treasure and believe in our fellow membership? Well, I, th- I think the first thing I think it should do is it should humble us. If we are not humbled by our inclusion in God's people, it probably means we've been drinking the Kool-Aid of presumption in our culture. If we're not humbled by it, we probably have been assuming rather than receiving with gratefulness. We should be humbled by this inclusion. Through no merit of our own, God has made us one of his people. Humbled and grateful. We should also, I think, desire to fulfill this plan. I mean, something that Paul is this excited about should have an effect on our life and our lifestyle. There should be a a sense almost of euphoria when you meet that fellow member for coffee and you're engaging them with their their life right now and finding out about their health and, and learning about how you can serve them and how their kid's doing it. Because what's happening there is, is nothing short of a miraculous move of God to bring together people from every tribe and nation. What's happening in that gospel-centered unity is, is a supernatural evidence that Jesus Christ could do what what no one on earth can do can bring people together who have no common ground except for in him. So small group meetings and moments of fellowship and Bible study and serving people with their move, th- th- those are not just sociological realities of the American life. No, no, th- those are spiritual ra- realities communicating God has, has brought together a people united by his son. There should be a a joy in fulfilling this, walking this out, seeing this take place. When, when we walk in to the gathering of God's people, there should be something of a, a joyful, upturned face that says, look, God, what you did is happening this morning. When you walk into the, the care group hot dog night, it shouldn't be, I don't like hot dogs. I mean, the main thing that should be coming is, look, look what's happening right now. God has brought people together in Christ, fellow heirs. When you are in conflict with someone in the church who sinned against you and is struggling with you, the first thought should not be, what a loser. I can't believe they have to be in my small group. It should be, this is a fellow heir in Christ Jesus. When someone disappoints you and you realize they're not perfect, they're not in heaven, you could say, well, of course, course they're not they're saved in Christ Jesus only sinners get saved so if they're saved of course they're a sinner and I can now fellowship with them in Christ Jesus this should work its way out in a sense of of privilege and joy as we do the Christian life together There, there simply is no place in Ephesians 
for a kind of individualized Christianity. Not primarily because it's unhealthy for the person, though that is true, but because it doesn't display the glorious purpose of God that Paul is outlining here and that Christ Jesus died to create. Final application, I think we can witness to this plan. <laughs> Ephesians chapter two and three, doesn't it just give you all the reason in the world to believe that the hardened sinner who believes there is no such thing as objective truth could certainly become a part of God's people? I mean, there, there is simply no person further off for a faithful Jewish mind than a Gentile. And so if Paul, the former Pharisee, can say, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, then there is no person, there's no person in your life or in my life that we can't look at and say, God can bring this person to him through the message of the gospel. No son, no daughter, no neighbor, no relative, no antagonist, no enemy is further away than we were as described in this passage and we have been brought near. So I think it should humble us. I think it should motivate us to, to fulfill this, to show it in real life with a joy and enthusiasm. And I think it should motivate us to witness about this. You could be a part of God's people. You can be reconciled to God through the gospel. I think it should delight us to treasure, to treasure the story. Let me encourage you, if you, if you haven't done that, go back and look at this story. Treasure the story. This part is about how that news was unveiled. Next week, it's going to be about how that news was proclaimed. Treasure the story of our inclusion in God's people the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to you because apart from your death, there would be no church. There would be no salvation. Apart from your grace, there would be no inheritance but wrath. But in you, Lord, in you, there is abundance, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in you has been given to us. And you've brought us together. Lord, in this church, you've brought us together. You've made us one in Christ Jesus. So we want to rejoice in that and give you the praise and the glory and express our gratefulness to you. Lord, cause us to be a church that is unified around the gospel. I ask you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.